so we did column space so when you have some matrix with some column 1 column 2 column 3 column 4 uh, so let's say it's a four columned matrix so these columns are going to be vectors okay so think about this clearly okay so suppose the dimension of this vector is m cross n right so what is the space in which each of these columns belong is it r m is to m yes r is to m very good okay so number of rows determines the dimension of the columns okay so if there are four rows then each column will have four entries so it's going to be in the r4 space all right so each column is in the r4 space so suppose you have these four column vectors then the column space is basically the set of all vectors vectors meaning points in r4 which can be represented as a linear combination of c1 to c4 okay so you can use these columns in some combination to generate these points okay so then that is the column space so for example suppose my uh, i consider a 4 cross 4 matrix 1000 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0100 and 0, 0110 okay so the column space of this matrix is equals to all vectors of the format x y z 0 you can take any vector of the format x y z 0 that vector can be represented as a linear combination of these two things uh, these uh, this linear combination of these four columns okay so basically if i call this as vector uh, matrix a and this as vector b then what i'm saying is that ax equals to b has a solution okay remember okay i should not use x here to avoid confusion let me call this w so this x vector so there exists some solution for ax equals to b at least one solution now obviously this fourth entity has to be zero because as you can see the fourth number in all these vectors is zero so that's very easy to decipher what's going to be the column space of this particular matrix but sometimes it's not going to be so easy so finding the column space is not always going to be that easy but we'll look at how we can find the column space of all different matrices uh, so this was column space and we also did a proof that column space is a subspace can anybody tell me what is the definition of a subspace in words in the simplest possible words that you can think i don't want a technical definition For a subspace uh, is a part of a vector space in which any combination mm -hmm. of two vector linear combination of any two vectors in the subspace also belongs in the subspace. Very good. Perfect. Ekdam perfect. Okay. So it's basically a subset of the original space in such a way that if you take a linear combination of any two vectors in that subspace, the, uh, the final thing that you get should also belong to the same subspace okay so in a way it's some sort of a cyclical sort of thing okay that it's sort of a trap if you are a vector in this subspace you cannot come together and get out of the subspace you will be stuck in the subspace okay so it's sort of a trap for these vectors and these vectors together they cannot come together so for example these four vectors right you take linear combination of any of the four vectors uh, in whatever linear combination you can uh, think of, the fourth uh, fourth coordinate will never be positive. The fourth coordinate can never become positive. 
All right, so that's a subspace. Then we talked about null space. Okay, so null space is basically when you solve ax equals to zero, then all the x vectors which can solve this will be called the null space. Sorry, there was a call. Okay, so all the x vectors which you can solve which can solve ax equals to zero are going to be the null space. So coming back, if A is a M cross N matrix, what will be the vector space in which X belongs to? R is going to, to N. Okay. So yeah, it is going to be R is to N because for matrix multiplication to make sense, this X vector must be N cross one, right? Only then the vectors, then the matrices can be multiplied. Okay. So it's going to be the RN space. So in the RN space, all vectors X, which can solve AX equals to zero can uh, be considered uh, a vector in the null space. Now null space again is a subspace. We saw the proof for that. But the interesting thing is that there will always be at least one X which solves this equation. That is called the trivial solution. So X equals to zero vector is the trivial solution. Trivial solution matlab kisi ko bhi jayega hai solution. Simple solution. Okay, so trivial solution means ax equals to zero is all going to be true when x is equals to zero. Obviously, vectors, okay, these are not scalars. When I say x equals to zero, it does not mean that x is the number zero. It means that the x is a vector of zeros n times because it is in Rn space. Okay, I keep coming back to these things again and again because uh, all our algebra that we have done till now, it has habituated our brain to think of X as a scalar, as a number. It's not in linear algebra, X is a vector. Even if I don't put this sign above it, X is a vector. Even if I don't write A like this, A is a matrix. And here again, zero is also a vector. So coming back, uh, what I'm saying is that X equals to zero is a trivial solution. Now, when do we have solutions other than X equals to zero? So that will happen depending on some property of this A matrix. So the property of the A matrix, which causes solutions other than X equals to zero in the null space is that the column vectors in A are linearly dependent. Okay, so you can remember this. We did the proof last time. When column vectors are linearly dependent, AX equals to zero will have solutions other than zero. When column vectors are linearly independent, then AX equals to zero will have just the zero vector. So coming back to this matrix, which I gave you, do you think that the null space will have solutions other than the trivial solution. Basically, you have to look at these four vectors. Do you think that the null space will have vectors other than the trivial solution? No, sir. Okay. First question is, are these vectors linearly dependent or independent? They're independent. I feel. Okay. They are not independent because 
they are not independent because you see this is vector 1 this is vector 2 vector 3 vector 4 so you can write vector 4 as a linear combination of v2 and v3 right v4 is equals to v2 plus v3 so v4 does not have a separate identity of itself so this implies that these are linearly dependent And when they are linearly dependent, AX equals to zero will have solutions other than the uh, solutions other than just the uh, zero solution. Okay, so I can actually construct such a solution 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1, 1, 0 times some a b c d equals to 0 0 0 0 so this is what i want so you can think of uh, a as 0 1 1 minus 1 right so when i expand this multiplication what this becomes is 0 times column 1 which is 1 0 0 0 plus 1 times column 2 0 1 0 0 plus 1 times column 3 0 0 1 0 plus uh, minus 1 times column 4 0 1 1 0 right and when you add that up you will basically see that this becomes 0 0 0 0 okay so these vectors they are linearly dependent and that gives me solutions other than the trivial solution okay so linear dependence linear independence is very crucial in understanding null space column space stuff like that yeah. so let's uh, move to so you, go, you guys do this page 11 from LADW. Let's move to complete solutions. So now the aim is to find the set of all solutions for AX equals to B. So when in the first lecture, when we introduced uh, this concept of solving AX equals to B, I said that a system of linear equations has three possibilities. So when you're solving AX equals to B, You can have three different options. Either you can have no solution or you can have a infinite solutions or you can have a unique solution. So now we are going to look at the situation uh, like how to decipher which situation you are in. <clears throat> All right, so first let's look at no solution. When are you in no solution case? When B does not belong to the column space of A, then you have no solution. Because the definition is that if B belongs to column space of A, then there should be at least one solution. So the first step that we go to do is we identify this column space of A and we verify if B belongs to this column space or not. So that's going to be the step one. Right. So how do I do that? <clears throat> uh, so to understand that, suppose you have a, let's start with a simple matrix, this matrix one, two, one, two. So we'll start with simple matrices and then we'll see uh, how to employ the same techniques for complicated matrices. So let's look at this simple matrix one, two, one, two, and try to identify the column space. So suppose I'm solving that for some B1, B2. For some B1, B2, I'm solving this AX equals to B. So what should be the relationship between B1 and B2 such that this thing has a solution? That is what I'm looking at. So what should be the relationship between B1 and B2? Now, in a simple matrix like this, I know that B1 and B2, since both these vectors are in 1 is to 2 ratio, 
B1 and B2 must also be in 1 is to 2 ratio. That is B2 should be equal to twice of B1. When this is true, then you can have a solution. If anything else is true, then we cannot have a solution. Okay, so if B does not satisfy this condition, we have no solution. Okay, and when it does, when it does belong to this, uh, when it just satisfy this condition, then what are going to be the set of all the solutions? <clears throat> So the set of all solutions are going to be, so suppose it satisfies this condition, right? B1 and B2 satisfy this condition. Then if you expand the system of equations, what you get is the first equation becomes U plus V equals to B1. And the second equation becomes twice of U plus V must be equals to B2, which incidentally is twice of B1. So both these equations are same. Right, so both these equations are basically the same. So you cannot solve for u and v separately. u and v are not solvable separately because these are not different equations, the same equation. So which actually superimposes the idea that I do not have a unique solution. I have infinite solutions, right? So I will have infinite solutions here. So now I'm looking at what is the set of all these infinite solutions? Can I characterize all these infinite solutions? Obviously it's an infinite solution. So I cannot tell you each and every solution, but can I characterize this set of solutions, which is going to solve it? So simple characterization is one minus uh, Tn one plus T. Okay, that's a simple characterization. So depending on whatever B1 you have, right? So suppose B1 is equals to, um, yeah, B1 is equals to this. So this becomes the set of all solutions. So U and V which satisfies U plus V equals to B1 is going to do the trick, right? So this is the set of all solutions. All U and V which add up to B1 are going to solve this. So as an example, one, two, one, two times UV equals to, let's say 50 and 100, right? So all U and V so that U plus V is equals to 50 will solve this. U plus V adding to 50. So you can take U and V to be 50, zero. You can take them to be 49, one. You can take them to be 100 and minus 50. Even that will work. As long as they are solving this thing, that's going to be my solution. Now, in the UV plane, what, what uh, figure or what curve represents this equation? U plus V equals to 50. So a straight downward sloping line. Very good. So it's going to be u plus v equals to 50 is a downward sloping line which looks like this. So this infinite line represents the infinity of solutions that you have for this system of equations. Okay. Now, all this is happening because these two vectors are linearly dependent. Because they are linearly dependent, that's why we have a restriction on the column on the column space. Not all B1, B2 can be solved. Only B1, B2 which satisfy B1 equals to twice B2 can be solved. Sorry, B2 equals to twice B1 can be solved. Okay. And so when you when the vectors are linearly dependent, what you have is a situation of either no solution or infinite solutions. So if this condition is met, then you have infinite solutions. And when this condition is not met, you have zero solutions. And the, these, this, uh, this two pronged uh, outcome is basically the result of the vectors in the column being linearly dependent. Now, had these vectors been linearly independent, so suppose, for example, I take a matrix in which the column vectors are linearly 
independent. Let's say one, two, and instead of one, two, I take one, three. So this is my matrix A times UV equals to B1, B2. Then what happens is that since these vectors are linearly independent, quite simply, right, quite simply, the column space becomes the entire R square. Which implies all B1, B2 are solvable with a unique solution. Right? So all B1, B2 are solvable with a unique solution. So just by changing the linear independence of these vectors, I can affect everything. So all that you want from infinite solution, no solution or unique solution is hidden in the column space of the matrix A. Right? So that's the important thing. So these connections are very important because they can ask you questions about it. Right? So they can ask you questions about it. It won't be numerical. These are going to be analytical type of questions. And that's the kind of questions which exams like. They don't want you want to give you very complicated mathematical problems because the time is not there for you to solve it. Plus, uh, uh, analytical questions are also nice because uh, uh, you don't need a lot of uh, workspace to do it. Anyway, coming back, so let us look at a little complicated vector now, like this. Okay. So there are four vectors in R3 space C1, C2, C3, C4. So the column vectors, they belong to R3, right? Now four vectors in R3 space, are they linearly dependent or independent? Are dependent dependent because the maximum independent vectors you can get in r3 is three yeah so the maximum independent vectors you can get in r3 is three so they are definitely dependent if you go to any vectors more than three they are going to be dependent so similarly in rn space if you have uh, more than n vectors, they are definitely going to be linearly dependent. The maximum number of independent vectors you can have in Rn space is n. That is the size of the basis vectors that you have. That is the number of basis vectors you need to span the entire space. <clears throat> okay, so these are definitely uh, definitely linearly independent, linearly dependent, which means that if I solve any AX equals to B, I will either have infinite solutions or I have zero solutions. There will be no case of unique solution. Okay. There will be no situation of unique solution possible. All right. Uh, so we proceed with the standard uh, Gaussian elimination. We are going to pivot this entry, make things zero. So after doing the first step, okay, the first step is going to be row two minus twice of row one. So that will make this thing zero and row three goes to row three plus row one. So that will make this thing zero. So I make these things zero. So what happens is when I make these things zero, these two things automatically become zero. 
Now remember in Gaussian elimination, what we used to do is first we used to make this pivot, these things zero, and then we used to make this thing pivot. This thing is already zero. The thing underneath it is also zero. So what I'll do is I'll move right and I make this thing pivot. So this is what I'll do now. Okay. So I'll make this pivot, try to make this thing zero. So row three goes to row three minus twice of row two. So when I do that, both these entries become zero. So the number of pivot entries that you had is these two. So number of pivot entries becomes equals to two, which is basically equal to the rank of matrix A. The rank is a very important phenomenon. Rank of a matrix is number of pivot entries. Why it's important is that rank of a matrix tells you how many independent vectors are there in the column space? Okay, how many vectors out of these four vectors? How many are the independent vectors? So rank of a matrix A gives you the number of independent vectors in the column space of A. Okay, so I told you that you cannot have more than three independent vectors. That does not imply that you will always have three independent vectors. If you, if I'm given four vectors, it does not mean that it has to be equal to three independent vectors. It can be less than three also. I could have given you a matrix like this, one, zero, zero, two, zero, zero, 300, 400. In this case, the rank is equals to one. That is only one independent vector is there. This vector is the only independent vector. This is twice of C1. This is thrice of C1. This is four times of C1. So they are all dependent on C1. So these are all dependent vectors. Okay, so just because the dimension is three and you have more vectors does not imply that you will necessarily have three independent vectors. It automatically implies that there is degree of dependence here, but we cannot find that without looking at Gaussian elimination always. In this case, it's very easy because it's a very easy matrix. In this case, it's very easy, but sometimes we'll have to actually do the Gaussian elimination and then figure out not how many independent vectors are there. Okay. So let us quickly look at a problem where you have to find the rank of a matrix. Let me open a problem. Okay, I've given the solutions also here. Do I have one without the solutions? No, I don't. Anyway, uh, so why don't you guys verify that the rank of this matrix is indeed two, the part A. Okay, so I want you to all to verify that the rank is indeed two. Basically do Gaussian elimination, that's what I want you to do. Do let me know that if you don't get two. The idea is that you should be able to find the rank. So if you are stuck anywhere, if you are facing any problems, then you should let me uh, let me uh, know. Okay, so find the rank of this matrix.
So I got one. You got one. Yes, sir. I'm also getting one. Is it? Ah, uh, okay. Maybe I did it wrong. Then let's see. One, two, one. Okay. Let's pivot this entry. <clears throat> Okay, I don't like uh, to do fractions. So what I will do is I can shift the vectors minus one, minus two, one, minus four, two, and four, eight, minus four, 16, minus eight. So what I've done is I've done this. Why I'm doing this is because I don't want to do one by four, one by three. So I don't want to do one by four. So I take the smallest thing here. So that way calculations are going to look a little neater. So that will not change the rank of a matrix. What I'm basically saying is that suppose this was X, Y, Z, or suppose this was W, X, Y, Z axis. So what I'm saying is I call the W axis as X axis. So that's all I'm doing. Okay. And uh, two, four, minus two, eight, minus four. Okay. <sighs> All right, so I'm going to pivot this. So row two minus plus four times of row one. So that will give me, okay, this is minus one, minus two, one, minus four, two. This will become zero, 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 zero. Okay, row three plus three times row one. So that will be, Zero, 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 zero. Yeah, fine. Yes, and row four plus twice of row one, so that will also be zero, 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 zero. Okay. So yeah, you are right. So there's only one. The rank is one, which means that there is only one independent vector here. So you can actually see that. So if I call this as column one. This is twice of column one. This is minus column one. This is four times column one. And this is minus two times of column one. So they are all dependent on column. Now, now you don't actually uh, have to imply here that everything is emanating from column one. Alternatively, you can take this as the base column. Okay, you can call this column three as base column. Then this becomes minus four times column three. This becomes two times column three. This becomes minus two times column three. And this becomes minus times column three. We cannot actually pinpoint that which of these vectors is the actual source. But the idea is you can take any one of them and then generate others using this one. Okay. So that's the idea. So the at max, you'll have one independent vector here. That is the key here that you have one independent vector here, that one independent vector, you can take any one of them to be the independent vector. The rest of them become dependent on that particular vector. So it's not about key who comes first and all those things, because you can interchange the columns also that will also not change the structure of the, the, the actual matrix. The rank of the matrix will not change. Okay. So interchanging rows or interchanging columns, this is not going to affect the rank of a matrix. Okay. So rank remains one and which implies that the, there is only one independent vector here. Okay. Now the idea is I have to identify the column space of a matrix. So after I do the row elimination using the echelon form, I reach here. I reached here. After this, I tried to, I want to uh, make it even more appealing, even more easier to solve. So what I do is after this step, I do row two goes to row two by three. So I get here and then I pivot this thing and make this thing zero. So row one goes to row one minus thrice of row two, right? So that will give me this particular outcome. So basically the aim is to make it simplest possible matrix. 
the most reduced form you can make it into the maximum number of ones you can ones and zeros you can generate so this is the maximum numbers of ones and zeros you can generate after this uh, you cannot do anything further using just row operations okay any further row operations is not going to make it simpler so now i work with this matrix this is the reduced a let me call it matrix ar okay now first let's focus on null space of a what is the null space of a so when i'm solving ax equals to 0 it is equivalent to solving arx equals to 0 okay so the solution for ax equals to 0 will also be a solution if if for some x ax equals to 0 is the true equation then for the same x arx equals to 0 also becomes the same equation why can anybody argue why so my claim is if x solves ax equals to 0 then x solves arx equals to 0 where ar is the reduced form of the matrix a Well, because the reduced form is uh, in a way a linear combination only, like it is the same thing itself. Can you think in terms of row operations? If I expand this, AX equals to 0, 0, 0, 0. So maybe because ARX is just the simplified form of AX equal to 0. Okay, but that argument will not pass through. Think in terms of what am I doing to A here? Remember that when I'm so when I used to solve AX equals to B, I used to tell you whatever row operations you do on matrix A, the same row operations have to be done on matrix B. So I'm doing row operations on A and same row operations on B here. Does that give you a hint? So ARX equal to zero is a linear combination. Okay, no. So yeah, what you're saying is true. All that is true, but that is deeper. Proving that will be deeper than just words. What the solution I have is I'm doing row operations here and I continue doing same row operations here. But doing any row operation here will continue to make this a matrix of zeros, right? Do whatever row operations. So the first row operation, suppose I did R2 plus 4R1 here. If I do the same row operation R2 plus 4R1 here, it will continue to be a zero. So the row operations simultaneously happen on A and zero, but zero is immune to all row operations because kuch bhi kar lo, zero to zero hi rahega. Sare zeros hai na? so that's why ax equals to zero the system of equations is same as solving arx equals to zero so remember the crucial thing which you want to remember is row operations don't just happen on a they need to happen simultaneously on b as well Okay, it's just that in this case, the B vector is a zero vector and it is immune to all row operations. Is it clear now that why these two things are same? Actually, this, this system of equation and this system of equation are the same system of equations. So whatever solves the first system of equations also solves the next system of equations. Okay. All right. So. I can solve ARX equals to zero. So when I'm solving ARX equals to zero, what is the reduced form? Coming back to the reduced form. Yeah, so this is the reduced form. Okay. So the null space, now I want to find the null space, the entire set of vectors which form the null space of this particular matrix. Okay, so I had these two vectors as pivot. Okay, 
So corresponding to this vector, the variable is u and corresponding to this vector, the variable is v. Sorry, not v, w. So u and w are the pivot variables. And V and Y are the free variables. So what are pivot variables and free variables? So free variables are variables which can take any value and pivot variables are variables which will take values according to the free variables such that the equation gets solved. Okay. So come back to this, uh, this case, which we were doing one, two, one, two, one, two times UV equals to 50, 100. So I said that the set of solution is U plus V equals to 50. So in this case, when you do the Gaussian elimination, this becomes the pivot variable U. So what I can say is that we can take any value. You will take a value which is 50 minus V. So you can take any value for V. You will take a value in such a way that this equation gets solved. When this equation gets solved, this equation gets solved. So similarly here, V and Y can take any values. U and W will take values in such a way that this equation will get solved. Right? So step one is finding your pivot entries. Step two is, actually this was the pivot, but basically this column represents the pivot column. So corresponding to that, you have the third variable. Anyway, uh, so the first step one is reducing it, finding the pivot variable, uh, pivot uh, columns corresponding to that, finding the pivot variables, and then the free variables can take any value. So how do I proceed from this point on? So let's look at the equations that I have. The equations that I have, if I look at the first equation, this times this is equals to this. So that will just be u plus 3v minus y is equals to 0. Okay, so that's my first equation, which implies that u must be equals to minus 3v plus y. So now I have the pivot variable as a function of free variables. Okay. And here I have my W equals to minus Y. How do I get this? You can solve this equation number two. So that will give me W plus Y equals to zero. So this just gives me that, okay, W and U were the pivot variables, so W equals to minus of Y. So W equals to minus of Y. So now you can write U, V, W, Y in terms of U becomes minus 3V plus Y, W becomes minus Y. So this becomes a null space vector. Obviously, it's not going to be a single vector because you have an infinite subspace which has all the solutions in it. You can take any value for V and Y. You can put any value, any real number value for V and Y here. Any solution that you get will be a vector in the null space. Okay, so basically, uh, yeah, minus three, one, zero, zero. So you can write this in terms of, you can take V things out. So if you look at V, V is minus three, one, zero, zero. So minus three, one, zero, zero times V. And Y is one, minus one, one. So one, 
minus one, one times y. So this is another way to write the null space vectors. Okay. Let's do another example. I know it's a little difficult, but that's the nature of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Take this matrix A. I don't want you to look at this. I'll hide this. Find null space of A. Null space is basically this final solution which I represented here. In this terms, this was the null space, right? So in this question, I want you to find the null space. Okay, so first do Gaussian elimination and tell me which columns are going to be the pivot columns. So column one and column three. Okay, I'm waiting for others. Yes, sir. Same column one and three. Okay. So two two minus twice of row one and row three minus uh, thrice of row one. So that will give me one, two, three, five. 0, 0, 2, 2, right, and 0, 0, minus 2, minus 2, okay, after this pivot here, then what you get is row 3 plus row 2. So 1, 2, 3, 5. If you have done this, proceed. The aim is to find the null space. So don't stop here. Okay, find me the entire null space. 0, 0, 2, 2. And then row 3 plus row 2. So minus 2 plus 2 is 0. Minus 2 plus 2 is 0. So 0, 0, 0, 0. So these are my pivot columns. I'm going to simplify this further, okay, because the more simplify simplification I do here, the easier is going to be the final results. So after this, I'm going to pivot here. I'm going to divide this by two, first of all. So row three by row two by two, basically just, I'll just write this one, one. And then finally, row one, Pivot this, make this zero. Row one minus thrice of row two. So one, two, zero, two, zero, zero, one, one. No, yeah. And zero, 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 zero. Okay. 
sir i have a doubt yeah uh, like it's a little silly but if it is not a square matrix so how do we identify no. the pivot uh, like uh, there is no diagonal so i'm not able so to so the idea is the once you have a pivot you move diagonally to the next one okay now if you find this thing zero then the idea is to look at the numbers below it if the number below it was not zero suppose this number was 7 then what you would do is a row exchange you will do a row exchange here so then row exchange will give you 7 minus 2 minus 2 here 0 2 2 here and then you would make this pivot the problem here was that this thing is also zero yeah this is the matrix we had so this thing could not be a pivot anything below it could not be a pivot so what we do is in this case we move rightwards okay and then you continue the same iteration this is how you do it so if okay. that two would have also been zero again move right may try to make this thing zero so remember this case i gave you the example that we did where rank was 1 this is exactly what happened right you did the first row operation everything became zero so you kept moving right nothing happening you move out of the matrix you say none of these can be pivots right that's what happened there all these numbers were zero so nothing could become a pivot afterwards so the rank was 1 so yeah that's what you do if these numbers were zero you would move right and then you would again move right and take this as pivot okay so uh, when do we do the column exchange we don't do column exchanges here we don't okay. uh yeah we don't do column exchanges here uh i i do row exchanges sometimes just to make this first row to be the smallest numbers because otherwise i'll have to use fractions so that is one trick which we are used but that's still a row operation you don't mix up row and column operations sath mein because the thing is when i'm solving ax equals to b any row operation here and a similar row operation here will continue to make the equation same but if i do a column operation here i will have to do a row operation on x okay to give you an example what i'm saying suppose the system of equations is x plus y is equals to 10 and x minus y is equals to 7 so if i want to represent this in matrix format 1 1 1 minus 1 times xy is equals to 10 7 right so this is the matrix format now when i do a column switch here what i'm basically doing is i'm writing this equation as y plus x equals to 10 and minus y plus x equals to 7 so now y is coming first and x is coming second so when i do a column switch like this then these vectors will have to go y and x so that's why i don't do column switches because if i make any shifts in columns i'll have to change my x vector okay sir yeah. got okay. it okay so don't do it row operations here cause changes in b so i don't i want to leave this untouched so that's why i'll not do any column operation but since you asked i told you this so if you are sometimes thinking sometimes maybe a column operation is making your ax equals to b easier to solve remember that when you are making any column changes here where there is a column switch here make sure to correspondingly make changes in your x vector but my suggestion would be don't do column operations unnecessarily confuse ho jaoge theek hai cool so let's uh, come back what were we doing yeah so this is the simplest format that we can derive now the aim is to find the vector so u and w are my pivot vectors corresponding to columns 1 and 3 v and y are free so the 
first row that I have, sorry, I'll start with the second row. The second row that I have is W plus Y is equals to zero, which implies W equals to minus Y. And the first equation is U plus two V plus two Y is equals to zero, which implies U equals to minus two times V plus Y. So now I'll use these values minus y and minus two times v plus y to represent the column vector. The column vector finally is going to be u becomes minus two times v plus y. This is v, this is minus y, and this is y, which can be written as v times minus two one zero zero plus y times minus two zero minus one one this is null space of matrix a okay so in the problem set this is clear this much should be clear to all of you we have done two problems so the steps must be clear obviously when you are doing problem set maybe you'll have to revise this video once more so do that, revise it once more. And then you have this complete set of solutions which you have to find. So in, when you're finding this complete set of solutions, you will have to find the null space. Anyway, now I know how to find the null space. Now let's come back to the original thing that I'm doing. That is the complete solution. All right. Uh, this note is basically saying that if uh, N is greater than M, that is number of columns is greater than number of rows then you should have at least one free variable. Okay. Basically the same thing, which I was saying that at, there will be linear dependence when number of columns is greater than number of rows, then it's like four vectors in R3. There will be at least one vector, which is dependent for every dependent vector. You will have a free variable. So the number of free variables will be positive always positive if number of columns is greater than number of rows. So these kind of things are something which questions can be asked upon. Anyway, we already discussed this bit, so I'm not going to spend time on it again. Let me talk about particular solution. So let's come back to solving this AX equals to B that we are trying to do. Now, whatever row operations we do on matrix A must also be done on matrix B. So I did row operations here. I did similar row operations here. Okay. So I, I have already reached this point starting from the original matrix and similar row operations. They cause the matrix, which was B1, B2, B3 to actually look like this. Okay. So I'm saving you the trouble of doing it. It's basically the same row operations. So now let's look at equation number three here. Mm. Equation number three. What is equation number three? This times this is equals to this. Now the left hand side of this equation is zero. So the right hand side must equal to be zero. So B3 minus twice B2 plus five B1 is equals to zero. This equation needs to be satisfied for the system of equations to have a solution. It's as simple as that. Okay. So when you're solving with for AX equals to B, whatever row operations you did here, do the same row operations here. If you come across a zero vector here, right? The, then this thing must be zero. Okay. The final thing must be zero no matter what, it's as simple as that. Okay, the final thing must be zero. B3 minus twice B2 plus five B1 must be equal to zero. Now, if B1, B2, B3 satisfy this equation, 
then ax equals to b has infinite solutions and when it does not then it has no solution what is this an equation of in r3 suppose b3 is suppose b1 b2 b3 is x y z for simplicity because we like x y z right so in r3 what is this this thing an equation of is it a line a plane what is it an equation of plane plane very good so it's a plane right so uh, this is a plane in r3 we already proved that it's going to be subspace because this represents the column space of matrix a so this is basically a plane which is a subspace so it passes through the origin okay so origin is always going to be there because every subspace should have the origin in it there can be no subspace which doesn't have the origin included in it okay so this is your relationship between d1 b2 b3 all right so if this equation is not solved then you have no solution if it is solved then you have infinite solutions so that's the idea so yeah so this was the original thing we were trying to solve this was our a matrix this was our b matrix so the first thing we verify is that does this b matrix satisfy this equation or not so let us substitute these b values in this equation so b3 is 5 minus twice into 5 plus 5 times into 1 so that is equals to 0 so this equation is solved which means that this system of equation will have infinite solutions okay now how do i find this infinite solution so i do the row operations here i do similar row operations here i reach this situation now the aim is to find at least one solution to find xp which is a particular solution so this is the beauty of this part so there are infinite solutions how do i find infinite solution so the thing is you find any one solution to this any one solution and then you add all the null space vectors to it it will become the set of all solutions so first let's look at how to find one solution so finding one solution is very straightforward uh so you know that uh yeah so y and v are free variables so only w and u count so you take v and y as zero because they can take any value okay then let's look at the equations the first equation so let's start with second equation that would be easier to do so the second equation becomes this plus th this times this is equals to 3 so 3 times w plus 3 times y is equals to 0 now since i'm taking y to be equal to 0 so this just implies that w must be equal to sorry this two should be equal to 3 w must be equal to 1 now let's look at the first equation so u plus 3v plus 3w plus 2y must be equal to 1 vn y are free variables i am assuming them to be zero w has been calculated to be equal to 1 so this just gives me u plus 3 is equals to 1 which implies u equals to minus 2 so one solution is minus 2 0 1 0 so this is my x particular now the complete set of solutions is just the particular solution plus any vector in the null space so here's the idea if
if xp solves ax equals to b and xn solves ax equals to 0 then xp plus xn solves ax equals to b the idea is xp is a solution for ax equals to b now a times xp plus xn will basically be equal to a times xp plus a times xn which is equals to b plus 0 remember vectors that is b so if xp is a particular solution then xp plus xn is also a solution so you find one solution you find null space and then you add the one solution to the null space, you get all the solutions. Okay, so coming back, I had this particular solution, minus 2, 0, 1, 0, and this was my null space. So I add them up, I get the set of all solutions. Okay, this can alternatively be written as minus 2, minus 3v plus y okay i'm adding the vectors up uh second thing would be v third thing would be one minus y and fourth thing would be y so this is another way of writing the complete set of solutions for all v comma y you substitute different values for v and y you get all the solutions Okay. All right. So coming back to this example. B is 0, 6, minus 6. Yeah. In this case, solve when B is 0, 6, minus 6. So find the complete solutions. AX equals to B, 0, 6, minus 6. That solves it, right? Anyway, yeah, so I want the, so find a particular solution. We have already found the null space, by the way. So you already have the null space. Just find a particular solution. First verify if it belongs to the column space or not. I'm sure it will. And once you do that, then you find the complete solutions. Yeah, okay. I'll just be back.
So do we have B belonging to the column space or not? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is the equation which needs to be satisfied basically. B3 plus B2 minus 5B1. So if this satisfies this equation, then it belongs to the column space. <clears throat> so the reduced form basically becomes one zero zero. Two zero zero, three two zero, five two zero. Time and this will become B one, so that is zero. B two minus twice B one, so that is six, and the final thing becomes zero. Zero six zero. I can write this as u v w y is equals to zero six zero. After this, three variables, right? So the second equation just becomes Okay, anyway, I'm just giving you the entire answer. I want you to solve it. Take B and Y as zero. So you'll get the X particular. Did you guys get the particular solution XP? Is it minus nine zero three zero? Minus nine zero three zero. Okay. So yeah, twice of W must be equal to six. So W must be three. And this equation becomes Yeah, yes, particular solution is this. <clears throat> so that's the particular solution. Uh, by the way, I mean, if some solution is obviously visible to you, you don't actually have to proceed by solving this thing. Suppose sometimes uh, some solution is obviously visible that this thing definitely solves it. So you can use that particular solution also. Any particular solution plus the null space will give you the correct answer. So that's the reason why it this thing cannot be asked in an objective exam. If it does get asked, it will be in the subjective part of ISI. Or maybe they ask you to do it in an interview. But the idea is particular solution can be any solution. Need not just be the one we find like this. Okay, so it can be any solution. By the way, is has everybody got this particular solution?
Yes, sir. Is there anybody who has a doubt in this thing? Because you will be doing a big problem set based on this. All right, fine. So I guess all of you have got it. 